on your own. So the beginning of this research area, we started to understand the distribution of the skin microbiota in adults. So this was work done by Elizabeth Grice and part of the Human Microbiome Project many years ago. And essentially what they found was on an adult, and what I mean by adult here is sort of a 30 to 40 year old or somewhere between 20 and 40. So a middle-aged or younger aged adult after puberty. puberty. Um, what they looked at here was in a sebaceous area of the body. So as I mentioned, the face, the upper trunk, the upper you know, back and chest area. We have more of the compounds that are sebaceous. So we have more sebaceous glands. And so we have more sebum. And sebum is you know, essentially oil you know, when, you, when you talk about it in a lay term. You have more of it there. And as a result of that, you tend to have more organisms that metabolize that compound. And that happens to be QD bacteria. They used to be called propione bacterium. Uh, we changed the name because, you know, in understanding their, uh, where their origin and their phylogeny, we actually start to understand they're, they're not propione bacteria anymore. They're called QD bacterium. So that's important to understand. But this is driving, so the environment on the skin is driving these organisms. And like I said, same with the moist areas, like, under, you know, the axilla in between or under your arm or in between your, your elbow crease, on your feet, etc. These are going to drive a very different kind of microbiome. And so you can see a lot of um, Staphylococcus and Carini bacteria present in those various areas. And then in dry areas, like your lower leg or your forearm or your hand, you see a lot more proteobacteria other kinds of organisms that are present there. You see staphylococci. So, you know, in atopic dermatitis, for example, a lot of people have flares of that skin issue, eczema again, uh, in the elbow crease or behind the knee. And that happens to be driven largely by this organism called staphylococcus aureus. And they're, they live in that environment naturally. So part of why a disease manifests in a certain part of your body is because in a state of balance, they live there happily, not causing you a problem. But when there's an issue, like with acne, there's overproduction of sebum or an inflammatory response to those bacteria, or in the case of atopic dermatitis, you know, a barrier disruption, your skin breaks down, the organisms are already there and they can take advantage of that situation. So it's, it's important to understand that as you explore the skin microbiome. So this is some work that, that we did at Johnson & Johnson early on when, again, we started seeing this work on the adult microbiome and we had you know, an interest in understanding infant and how infant skin evolves over time. It's an area of research that we've done there for many years. And so this was a study that we did to look at what does the microbiome look like in the first year of life in infants. So we took a cohort of infants aged, you know, I think three weeks or to a month all the way to 12 months of age. So these are different infants in a, a series of groups. So there are about 12 or 15 babies in each of these age groups. So aged one to three months, four to six months, and seven to 12 months. And we looked at what does their microbiome look like? Is it like in adults? Does it look different? We know that the structure and the function of the skin in infants is different. They don't produce that much sebum because that happens at puberty when your hormones change and start dictating changes in your, in your biology like sebum production. That's why acne is more predominant or starts to be more predominant at that point in your life. But what we saw was that in an infant microbiome, it does not look like an adult. You don't see, this is basically the class of bacteria that QD bacterium are a part of. Uh, which are the acne causing ones, the ones you see all over your face and, and your upper trunk, those are a very large part of our microbiome in an adult. And that's because of the sampling in this area. In other parts of the area, you don't see as many of them as we saw in the previous slide. Uh, but on average, this is what you see. But in an infant, you see a very different uh, result. You see much more of these, what we call firmicutes, staphylococci, streptococci on their skin. So immediately it's clear that the microbiome is not the same uh, across time. So there's something different going on as the skin changes over, over your lifetime. And we, what we can see here is an increase in diversity that's occurring over time. And this would make sense in the sense that when a baby is born, it's their first exposure to microorganisms, you know, largely uh, af outside of the womb. And so their skin is essentially now getting colonized with organisms through the hospital environment, mom and dad, other people touching and, and holding the baby, all of those microbes that we have on our skin are getting exposed to the infant skin. And then the infant skin's environment and its unique environment is driving who gets to survive and colonize and, and live there. 
And so what we see, like I was mentioning, is a lot of strep in staph. And then over time, you see this expansion in these other organisms in the skin. So you're seeing this increase in diversity over time. But it's probably not done yet by the first year of age. So what we did was then we followed those same infants over time. So for the next seven years, basically, we followed them as well as their mothers to look at how the microbiome continued to evolve in a, in a child over time. So this would be, for example, in year one would be the samples of infants I just showed you on the previous slide. This is what their Shannon diversity would look like. So how diverse is their microbiome? It would be, this is the starting point. By two to three years, we don't see a significant change over time yet. And our hypothesis there is because the skin isn't that different yet. They're starting to, they're still at home. They're still in their, you know, local environment, the skin isn't, you know, actively changing, they're not growing that different from, you know, very early in their lives. But by five and six years of age, maybe they're going to school now, maybe they're exposed to a different environment and their skin structure function starts to evolve. And so you start to see this increase in diversity. And yet again, by six to seven years old, increase again. And this is in contrast to their mothers who microbiome, while variable, is largely consistent. And so this is in, you know, again, in that younger age range, you know, of an adult, the microbiome is pretty stable. And so we, we've known this for a while. I think there was a study done over the course of two years, which demonstrated that in adults, the microbiome um, of the skin doesn't change. So it becomes like your microbial fingerprint. Uh, but there were continued questions about, well, is that forever? I mean, as we continue to age, our skin changes yet again. We get into, you know, for example, here, once this likely continues to evolve until we hit puberty, the hormones are then really driving a lot of changes in the skin. That's when you get your, quote, adult-like microbiome, all those cutie bacteria that colonize the skin. And that's when your microbiome becomes very stable. But then you continue to age. And we know as we age, our skin changes, the structure changes, the function changes. So what does the microbiome look like there? So I'll get into that in a second, but this is just a summary of what I was just describing, this idea of the microbiome continuing to evolve. And then it's in the young adult state, it's relatively stable with the organisms present. But now we know that as we continue to age, because we all do, and we get into our 50s, 60s, and 70s, the microbiome changes yet again. And so this was a study done by Procter & Gamble, um, was published just this year, that looked at an adult, all of these were female subjects. So they looked at the buttock skin, the face skin, and the forearm skin of all of um, these hundred and some odd women that they recruited into their study. And what they see is that there are a large number of lactobacilli that they see present on the buttock skin that go down over time. Now, this is largely because in the vaginal microbiome, we often have lactobacilli, especially in young age, because it's driven or it's dictated largely by estrogen production. And as our estrogen production goes down in older age, lactobacilli don't have their favorite food sources anymore, which is driven by estrogen. And so the vaginal microbiome becomes less lactobacillus dominant and the buttock skin is quite close to the environment. So this is very likely why we see reductions in lactobacillus as we age on that part of the body. It's not because necessarily they colonize and live on the buttock skin, although there's more work I, I think that would need to be done to understand that. But importantly, on the surface of the facial skin, so as we've been discussing, this cutie bacterium level is going down as we continue to age. So you see a lot of them here, and this is what you saw in that younger adult age range, 30, 40, 50, or 20, 30, 40 rather. And then as you age, that amount of bacteria goes down. And that's because as we age, our skin doesn't produce as much sebum anymore. It dries out, it wrinkles, it changes in structure. And so these organisms that love oil don't have their favorite food source anymore and other organisms take up that space instead. So some of the interesting questions are, do, does that shift in the microorganisms then contribute to the aging process or is it simply an artifact of the changing of the skin? I mean, we've evolved with these organisms. So I think there are a lot of interesting questions that have yet to be answered about that. And this is an example from that same study of the diversity changes that you see. So you're seeing essentially an increase in diversity over time. And this is important because at the beginning of this field, it was diversity is key 
we always want to have more diversity, but that's not always the case. It depends on what you're looking at, what environment, and at what point in time you're looking at it. So as you see here, because you are aging and the face is the, the easiest way to look at this, as the as you age, you know, you have propione bacteria, cutie bacteria driving a very dominant part of that microbiome. So you have low diversity because they're taking up most of the space. So you don't have a lot of these other organisms. But as you age and the sebum goes away, all of these other organisms take up that space. So you see an expansion in diversity. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't think we know the answer to that and what the impact of that change is on the micro or on the skin rather itself. And this is an example of the um, sebaceous gland changes that are occurring. So the sebaceous gland function is larger in early life and goes down over time. So it's correlating with these changes in diversity. So this is a graph I made to sort of de depict, if you will, the change in microbial diversity over our lifetime to summarize what I just showed you. And that is here what you see, you know, in a newborn, microbial diversity, infancy, childhood is increasing. We reach adolescence where you see lots of oil production and the cutie bacteria taking over. And then in a younger adulthood it becomes very stable. You have healthy barrier function. And this is all in healthy skin, for example. Um, and that's pretty much the way it stays for a while until you start aging in advanced stage. You know, as you get into your 50s, 60s, 70s, now the sebum production goes down, your barrier changes and diversity goes up again. And where it goes from there, we'll continue to study this. But this gives you a depiction of, of the changes that are occurring over time.